All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for your patience as we had some technical difficulties, but we are back and hopefully you are here and I'm confirming we're broadcasting to the right place at the right time. Carol, thank you for the heads up. Let's make sure here. And I think there we go. I'm Dr. Jason Deitch. This is You've Got the Power. We are a little bit sorry. I'm a little bit sorry for the technical difficulties, but please join us. We've got a really important topic today, of course, with Dr. Chris Centeno, Chief Medical Officer of the Centeno Schultz Clinic. We normally talk on Mondays about CCI. Today's no different. Our topic today is can you have CCI and a normal DMX? There's a lot of confusion about what it takes to get an accurate diagnosis. There was a great blog post that was written just a couple days ago. I'm going to leave that down below as I hit it over to you, Dr. Centeno. Let's break down, for those that may be new to the show, what is CCI? How do people know they have it? And is it possible to actually have a normal DMX and yet still have CCI? Yeah, Jason. So uh, today we're talking about craniocervical instability or CCI. So that means that uh, the patient has loose ligaments that hold the head on, and that can cause lots of different symptoms, things like headaches, dizziness, imbalance, visual disturbances, rapid heart rate or tachycardia, and many other things as well. And uh, so the big question that I'd like to focus on today is if you have a normal DMX study, uh, can you still have CCI? And the reason why we're talking about this is a patient who I saw last week who had one measurement called ADI, called DMX, and at the end of the day, uh, once we put this patient to sleep, she had a grossly abnormal ADI. So that's what we'll dive into today. All right. We're getting lots of questions on all of that. You know, it isn't easy for people to... You know, a lot of people love certainty. They want, what's the answer, doc? You know, we want a definitive, take this test, get this answer with 100% certainty and clarity. Unfortunately, when it comes to human beings and healthcare and health, that doesn't always happen that way. And that's why this is such a maze for so many people to navigate. Um, a fascinating case you talked about, I did leave the link down below. Um, doc, how do people sort of navigate what they have to do in order? I mean, here they are, they've got these headaches, they've got these other symptoms, which is difficult to deal with in and of itself. But now to have those things and then get into the healthcare system <laughs> doubles or exponentially makes whatever symptoms you're experiencing worse. What are some of the key things that people have to sort of keep in mind as they're navigating the doctors they're going to, the test results they're getting back? Uh, you know, how to make sense of it and what to do with it without falling victim to, you know, other experts teaching them things that often are inaccurate. Um, there's got to be some key points that people understand and or is it, do they just need to find the right doctor they can trust, like yourself, like this show, so that they've got resources that they can ask trusted advisors on a regular basis? Yeah, for CCI, this is a super <clears throat> specialty area. So listen, we've got about three or four, maybe five surgeons around the U.S. that see a lot of this stuff. They've gotten very good at diagnosis. Obviously, you know, we are in that treatment plan between conservative care and surgery. Um, but it's very hard to get an accurate CCI diagnosis in the medical care system at large. Uh, I always say that patients often you know, are like a pinball in a pinball machine. They go from specialist to specialist to specialist, getting very few answers until finally, sometimes through luck, sometimes through research, find someone who can give them some answers. So getting to the right diagnosis can be difficult. It really is. Uh, we got a bunch of questions coming in. Do you want to lay out more about the case, about, uh, you know, false positives and negatives? Okay. Go ahead. Let me just, yeah. what happened in patient. So this was a patient with a normal uh, ADI measurement on DMX. So that's when you flex. Uh, there's not supposed to be much room between the, the atlas and the dens, and that's called the atlantodental interspace. DMX looked just fine. She had some abnormality on side-to-side -side overhang, which had improved about 50% from the first PICL, so she was coming in for a second one. Then we put her to sleep, 
And as we put her to sleep in flexion, we noticed that that ADI opened up substantially to become grossly abnormal. So that's a transverse ligament thing. Now she was supposed to be um, supposed to be, you know, just normal in that measurement. And, and why did it look normal in DMX? It looked normal in DMX because her muscles were working to to bring those two things together. As soon as we put her to sleep, muscles weren't working and the instability showed up. That tells us two things, right? The first thing it tells us is that uh, when it comes to DMX or any disease, there can be a false negative. I mean, the patient really has the disease, but the imaging shows that the patient doesn't or the test shows the patient doesn't. That's called a false negative. The second thing it shows us is that at the end of the day, just how important muscles are for stability. So when I try to get patients to do some of those exercises, that's the reason why, because stability is half ligament, half muscle. And you probably can't get completely normal without getting those muscles back. You won't be able to get as far down the road as you possibly can without getting those muscles back. It, it is very common to have these kinds of, I'll say, complexities, especially with something as specific uh, as this condition. I know, uh, unfortunately, most you know, people, consumers, uh, don't know how to ask for these nuanced issues. I know, you know, in, in the past, we've had issues not related to this exactly of even people that get like a standing MRI versus a laying down MRI. And it has everything to do with the same kind of thing you're talking about of sort of when we're alive and functioning, it's one thing, but when you actually uh, sort of maybe on a more passive side, as you said, when the patient was asleep, they are not voluntarily contracting muscles, et cetera the body changes under different circumstances. You really need to work with experts who do understand these very specific nuances of anatomy and physiology and positioning and making sure, especially when you're dealing with millimeters that are the difference between positive and negative, uh, to make sure you're dealing with doctors and I'll even say test sites um, that are experienced in this type of thing and can really navigate not just the data, but understand how to put that data together and make it make sense. Um, fascinating case. I know this is uh, very much the part of doctoring. Um, and even amongst doctors, there's no unanimous consent necessarily on many, many things. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do other doctors, how do you sort of develop your nuance? Is it really through experience and you know, like you said, watching what happened last week to kind of go, I got to pay attention to this versus many others who are much more novice at this. They don't have the experience. They maybe have good intentions, but they don't really have the expertise to address, especially this type of issue. Yeah, this is a super specialty area. So, you know, there's only, I think, as I've said, maybe three to five surgeons that see 80% of these cases across the United States. In the same way, when it comes to non-surgical care, there's just a handful of physicians that have any idea of which end is up. Um, so that's, that's the difficulty for many of these patients is trying to find someone who understands what's happening. And uh, that's very, very hard to do. Obviously, I, I think the last time I I looked, we had something like a million U.S. physicians. So literally, if you're talking about, let's say, you know, less than 10 people that know a lot about this subject that are doctors, then that's literally one in 100,000 doctors trying, like, trying to find a needle in a haystack. Uh, and the other corollary to what you're saying, which is the really challenging part, is there's not a lot of doctors that uh, willingly admit that they don't know certain things and they don't have experience in those things. Uh, that's part of the process of becoming a doctor is building that confidence, uh, which means that a lot of people are going to go to uh, not the one out of 100,000, but the rest of them do the math. Uh, and they're going to get uh, a certain uh, recommendation, diagnosis, um, you know, feedback as to what to do. And often are going to be wrong. And that's really hard for people to come to terms with. You know, it just doesn't add up that there could be so many smart, so many trained doctors in a particular area that can be wrong. <laughs> um, 
how, how do people make sense of that kind of thing? I mean, it is very common in today's world that sometimes what the majority believe may not necessarily be accurate to what a few who like yourself are brave enough to, you know, stand against the wind, stand against the current. It's not common medical practice to sort of understand and go into detail the way you do because most of medicine is really focused on drugs and surgery because that's what they've been trained and that's what reimburses the most. Is there something people can, I, I, you know what I'm asking, I think. How do people make sense of all of, all of this? Uh, and or is it just a Q&A process like we're going through right now called learning? Yeah, again, I mean, I think it's just finding people who are specialists in specific subjects. Medicine has lots and lots and lots of details and literally new things are discovered every day. And it's impossible as a physician to be good at all of it or even to know about all of it. Um, so the best you can do is to try to specialize in something and, and know a lot about that thing or five things or 10 things or whatever that is. Um, so in this case, how do you find one of those specialists that's where I think you know social media does come in handy because it helps to identify those doctors out there who might be putting more into knowing about a specific topic than, than another doctor who may not even know that topic exists because there's just too much information out there. And that information is you know, these days like a fire hose. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, before, if you've got questions, now's the time to ask. And, and what I love about what you just said is you know, one of the things we pride ourselves on, there's all this talk and media and criticism about Facebook and other social media sites and how dangerous they are, how bad they are, how, you know, maybe we should get rid of them and so on. And yet you're bringing up a perfectly, I think, super point, which is that these are the actual tools that give regular people the opportunity to learn, to in fact have access to you, to be able to ask questions for free on a show like this. Uh, and you couldn't do that without these types of you know, I'll call them basically free technologies. Um, so uh, let's make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater as we all get so, you know, riled up about the media telling us that Facebook is a bad thing. If you're here and we're here and we're learning together, I'm going to put some points on the board that that's a positive. Uh, as such, why don't we take a few questions? You good with that? Yeah. Let's hit it. We've got Robin Hay who says, uh, if C1 is holding adjustments for, let's say, a month, what's causing brain fog? I mean, so I, I think it's a, it's a good question. I think we've got to divorce instability from um, problems in the upper cervical spine. So, for instance, if we were to injure your C2-3 joint, um, and you don't have any instability at all, you could still get headaches and brain fog. Um, so it could be injuries to the upper neck joints. It could be irritated nerves that are still there. It could be muscle uh, proprioceptors that are giving bad information. Um, and there could be no instability or, or less instability uh, than there was. So just realize that, you know, those are two different concepts. One is instability, and meaning things move around too much. And the other is that something up there is giving a bad signal to the brain. And uh, those can happen together, but also separate. Very important. Robin, thank you for your question and hope that was helpful. Uh, I'm just gonna follow up on her. Uh, is there a, a nutritional component to this sometimes at all? I know uh, your stem cell formula, does any of that have anything to potentially do with brain fog or making sure you've got the right nutrients in your body or that's a whole separate conversation? Yeah, a whole separate conversation. All right, all right. Let's stay with the questions. We've got Mark Herbert. Mark asks, is it okay to inject lidocaine into ligaments? Is mixing lidocaine and dextrose prolotherapy with super concentrated platelets, SCP, normal for a Regenex provider? No. Um, so if we... If we use prolotherapy, um, actually I have a whole blog on this, with SCP together, meaning those were done in the same syringe, for example, or put into the same joint, then we'll create platelet raisins, uh, meaning we'll dehydrate the platelets. 
and that could impact uh, the function of the platelet. Uh, lidocaine is also not the preferred anesthetic for use. It would be ropivacaine rather than lidocaine. So no, that, that wouldn't be uh, normal practice and uh, prolotherapy and, and platelet-rich plasma can't be combined. Now, prolotherapy and platelet lysate, because those platelets are already broken open and we're just talking about growth factors, those two things can be combined. But prolotherapy and platelet-rich plasma with whole platelets cannot be combined. There you go. Thank you for your question, Mark. Let's move on to, I hope I say this right, Jalal. Uh, Jalal asks, can you please talk about panis on the transverse ligament? What is it exactly? And how does it form? And does it pose challenges to treatment? Yeah, so a panis is not on the transverse ligament, but uh, realize that there's a bursa there uh, between the transverse ligament and the dens, that allow, which is a lubricating sac that allows the C2 to rotate around the atlas. And when that bursa becomes swollen and or scarred down, that's called a panis. And if the panis gets big enough, it can put pressure out the back and the spinal cord can be sitting close to that area. Um, so that's the significance of a panis. Now, when it comes to treatment with something like the PICL procedure, it does make it a little bit more challenging because we're going below the atlas, we're gonna likely run into that panis. Um, that's not a problem other than it just means we're not injecting the ligament, we're injecting the bursa. Uh, hence, if you've got panis, over the atlas uh, is generally the way that that's dealt with to get into the ligaments. Excellent, excellent. Great question, Jalal, thank you. We've got Stacy Kaufman giving us a hi, how you doing? We've got Rachel Riggs saying hello. Hey, Rachel, hello, Stacy. Uh, we've got a question submitted in advance by Harry Winston. With DMX hard to come by in the UK, are there other tests you would need to see if I would be a candidate for your procedure? Yeah, so sometimes we can make the diagnosis off of a, um, a functional standing type or sitting type MRI. And uh, there's actually a, uh, a scanner in Swansea in uh, London area that um, can do that for you. Uh, so that would be the first place to start is to get an MRI scan uh, for rule out CCI at that upright MRI scanner in Swansea. There you go. Thank you, Harry, for your question. Rachel's got a question. Rachel says, uh, are there post PICL exercises for the CCJ I should be doing? And would you please share a few basics? This is Rachel Riggs. Yeah, Rachel, so that, those exercises are online. Um, and you've got to be approved by your doctor to, to do them. So you're at that point where you can get stronger, or we believe it's certainly a good place to try to get stronger. Um, uh, Jason can put those in the show notes, um, the link to those exercises, but definitely uh, clear that with your doctor first to see if you're ready to do those exercises, because you may or may not be. But yes, those are uh, online, um, we've got the whole program there. It's not something I can, can show you because it's a program six levels deep, but, I, but uh, we can certainly put the link there. She says, thank you. Minute, I'm not even gonna try to say it, my apologies. Uh, Minute, here we go. This is a long one, so please stay with me, doc. He says, hello, I had DMX done due to constant left-sided neck shoulder, scapula, and pain in my upper left arms, and also was diagnosed with POTS a few years ago. My DMX shows a 9.7 millimeter C1, C2 hangover to the right, and 5.4 millimeter to the left. I am planning to get posterior PRP done next week, but with such an extensive DMX finding, would the posterior approach be beneficial? MRI of cervical spine with min minimal finding and left shoulder is negative. That's what you got. Yeah, so no, that's a lot of overhang. So um, I don't think posterior 
Prolo is going to help at all with that. Um, so I, I think it's extremely unlikely to move the needle at, at all. Um, so I, I, you know, it's possible it, it could, but I think it's extremely unlikely to do that because even if we're injecting posterior, again, as I always say, you know, posterior prolo skill level is here, and the skill level that we're talking about to inject all the structures posteriorly is here. So the prolo skill level is not going to get you where you need to go for the most part. You need to be with someone who has higher level skills so that everything can be injected posterior that can be uh, treated. But in general, posterior injections aren't going to address uh, that kind of instability in the average patient. So probably wasting time and money there. Uh, is that something that he should reach out to somebody at the Centeno Schultz Clinic and get a second opinion on and you know, find out what his options are? Uh, Jason, I lost you lost your uh, audio. There we go. Technology doesn't seem to want to work today. Yeah, there you go. All right. You with me now? Yes. Beautiful. Technology comes in threes, I hope. Maybe the next one will be done with it. Um, is that something that he should reach out to the Centeno Schultz Clinic for a second opinion and maybe options of what other things uh, he may want to consider as possible treatments? Yeah, with that kind of overhang, that, that patient's a PICL candidate. So that's generally where we start these days, um, unless there's some reason to believe that they might not have symptoms related to that. But with that kind of overhang, that's a lot. Um, so uh, generally, that's where we would start. We wouldn't waste our time with, with posterior prolo in that kind of patient. All righty. So uh, you might want to reach out to the Centeno Schultz Clinic and find out either via telehealth or if you're in the Colorado Denver, uh, Broomfield region, come on in and really get an assessment to find out what your options are. Let's move to Stacy Kaufman. So would you agree that to get the most accurate DMX results, it makes sense to schedule the test during the time of day you have the least amount of pain and that it would be helpful to take a muscle relaxer before a DMX? That's a great question. Yeah, the pain thing might be hard to do, right? I mean, it, it's that one's sometimes hard to predict for patients, which days they're gonna be in pain versus which not. Um, obviously, if you can control it that way, that's a good idea. Um, a muscle relaxer, uh, yes, I think that would be helpful. Uh, but again, to do that, um, you're really gonna to want to make sure you have a driver, because you shouldn't, shouldn't be driving on that stuff. Um, so that'll add a little bit of complexity. Uh, you know, a 10 milligram Valium pill for most people would do it. For larger people, maybe two 10 milligram Valium pills. Um, those are good ways to try to uh, get the muscles as loose as possible. And then I think based on some of the things we're seeing on what we put people to sleep, if there's any question about whether or not that's an abnormal DMX, or they're still having a normal DMX, but they clearly seem to have CTI, we can put them to sleep and take a look at how, how much they can move. Uh, and I think finally get a 100% accurate answer there. So that, that's, but I think all of those things are generally good if you can do. There you go. Great question. I like the thinking, the logic. If this, if I, here's new information, if this, then that, and what about? And that's really just sort of great to be thinking this way. And that's why we get to ask these questions to uh, Dr. Centeno directly. Uh, Shanze Kans uh, asked, hi, Dr. Centeno, can PRP be done in the muscles or PPP is always better? If someone is sensitive to numbing agents, can it be tolerable to do a posterior procedure without any anesthetic? Uh, so when it comes to PRP versus uh, PPP, uh, that one is still being figured out. Uh, we do know that there's at least one lab-based study that seemed to suggest that PPP might be better in muscle than PRP. Having said that, no one's 100% sure yet between those two. Um, when it comes to doing uh, a posterior procedure without any anesthesia, there's certainly patients that can tolerate that without any problem. And there are patients who are more centrally sensitized where that would be a really, really bad idea. So it, it just depends on the patient there. There you go. Thank you for your question. 
Let's move on to uh, Stacy Kaufman again asks, if you assess patient symptoms and you examine instability after anesthesia, is DMX even ever needed once CCI has been diagnosed? If still symptomatic, is there any value to a future DMX? Yeah, so we use, uh, we can do repeat DMX testing to try to see if the patient is uh, reducing their numbers. So let's say, you know, someone didn't really have a big change in symptoms. That might be a good reason to repeat a DMX. As far as is DMX useful, I think it's very useful. I think it's the most useful tool we have. But it certainly is important to realize that all diagnosis all the diagnostic tools we have have a false negative and positive rate. So if I measure grab oaks on MRI, it's got a false negative rate or a false positive rate as well. If I measure your CXA, same thing, meaning that you might have a CXA of 128 and your neighbor who's never had a day of neck pain may have a CXA of 129. Uh, so we need to be careful with all of these measurements and all of these numbers so that all of the stars line up, not just the measurements. That, that's sort of the takeaway I'm hearing from you, Doc, is that you can't really, you know, as they say, rest your hat on any one particular thing. Uh, that this is very Sherlock Holmes-ish, that you've got to put multiple clues together and have some experience in order to be able to come to the right conclusion. And again, I sort of started this off early on by saying, you know, we all have to acknowledge we're looking for certainty. We're looking for a definitive answer. We're looking for how do we make sure that our doctors, you know, know exactly what the problem is and we're making the exact right decision in what type of treatment we should be having. And the unfortunate reality in healthcare is it, it's not always so. In fact, it's often not so absolute. And that's what you know, the skill of doctoring is really all about. It's understanding through experience, through the nuances of each of these tests uh, and the experience that you have working with others. That's really what makes, I'm gonna just sort of say, the Centeno Schultz difference. Uh, it's less about the product, the orthobiologic, you know, PRP or Prolo or what it is, which is seems to be the feeling that you can just get anywhere you know prp is prp it's a commodity but it's really not because it has everything to do with concentration it has everything to do with making sure it goes in the right place because you have image guidance and it has everything to do with making sure you've got doctors who are trained experts in these very specific diagnosis and treatment uh, and recovery or rehabilitation uh, experiences that really is the difference that makes the difference you want to comment on that or should we keep going? I know we got a lot of questions and not a lot of time. Thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, expertise matters. Uh, so for example, I just had a patient write me and say, hey, I'd like to get my upper neck injected by this guy. And I was like, well, I think that guy's probably only done it a dozen times. So let's not do that. Uh, because, you know, this is an area where unless you've done it a couple hundred times, you can hurt somebody. So let's, you know, that's a good example, but let's go to some questions. Right on, right on. Uh, these are not all the same anywhere you get them. Experience matters, that's the message. Here we go, we've got Jalal. Dr. Rosa talks about brain fog being due to impaired CSF flow and garbage drainage from the brain. If the CSF flow is improved through improved alignment, should the brain fog improve? Yeah, I don't think we know that to be true yet. I think that's a theory that Dr. Rosa has, and I think it's a good theory uh, about what's happening and what's causing the brain fog. Um, having said that, um, you can also get brain fog if I, like I said, if I injure your C23 facet joint, you can get brain fog. Uh, that has nothing to do with the flow going through your CSF. Uh, just realize, I think that's a very good theory, and that may, may be what's causing your brain fog. Your brain fog could also be caused by uh, impingement of the internal jugular vein, which I know Dr. Rosa talked about as well. It can also be caused by bad proprioception or physician sense. Just realize it's it's not so simple. Yeah, and the, uh, I will point out that the earlier question did acknowledge that she had been holding her adjustments for more than a month. 
so she sort of ruled out that as a possible cause based on her experience and so on. So uh, we continue to investigate. Stacy Kaufman asks, uh, can PICL correct reverse retroflexed odontoid? I mean, there's two concepts there. Uh, one is that the odontoid was built that way, right? Congenital. It just goes backwards, and that's just the way it's built. The other is that the odontoid is retroflexed because of laxity in the transverse ligament. Obviously, in the first instance, nothing about PICL is going to change your anatomy, uh, the anatomy that God gave you. Um, in the second instance, absolutely uh, yes. If we tighten down the transverse ligament, we can change the amount that that dens, odontoid goes back. So it all depends on what's causing the retroflex the dontoid. There you go, exactly right. Okay, Rachel Riggs gives a thank you very much with a bunch of exclamation marks. Rachel, thank you for that. Pia, she says, thank you for this. As you know, there is a huge connection between the neck and jaw. What does it say about the instability that the lower jaw sits too far forward now and the bite no longer fits? It seems like the C1 is slipped forward. Actually, the butt fits better when I push the atlas back. Have you heard other patients mention this? I haven't heard patients self-manipulating and then reporting that their, their jaw alignment is better. I can certainly say that when the upper neck is involved, uh, we tend to see the jaw muscles being used as a, a head stabilizer. And they're not designed to do that, so the jaw uh, can get overloaded, and that must, certainly might include changes in position of the jaw, um, arthritis within the joint, which can change position of the jaw, et cetera. So haven't heard a patient directly tie a self-manipulation to change in jaw, but that actually might be a better question for some of the upper cervical chiropractic experts who do NUCA or AO. It is not uncommon for uh, upper cervical chiropractic adjustments to help people improve the uh, TMJ condition, uh, whether it's through, as you mentioned, uh, muscle tension, uh, whether it's through the anatomy changing and so on, depending on what the cause of the TMJ is, but there absolutely is a connection there often. Um, so great question and thanks for that. We've got Daniel Iverson who asks, hi, Dr. Centeno, I'm diagnosed with CCI and AAI from a neurosurgeon in Spain. Dr. Rosa says my atlas is robust, uh, is robust misalignment, rotary misalignment of C1, C2. Is it worth to try out atlas orthogonal before regenerative? My atlas has been out one year now. Um, certainly, I think it's uh, atlas orthogonal would be great to try um, and see if you can hold an adjustment. There's no reason, I think, not to try it. It's very low force. It's very gentle. And um, see if they can get it back in. Now, if they can't or if it keeps coming out again, then you would want to focus on things like the PICL procedure. If you've been told you're already a fusion candidate, then generally those patients are candidates for PICL as well. Um, so, uh, but there's no reason not to try AO and, and we see lots of patients who do very well with AO. Outstanding. Paul DeFusco, regular viewer. Hi, Paul. Uh, he asks, are there scenarios where the DMX is the only image showing CCI while other image shows very little? What would you do to convince other specialists and or insurance companies in that scenario? Uh, where the DMX is the only one. DMX is the only movement-based uh, technology we're talking about here. So um, realize that uh, when we're talking about instability, that's a movement-based concept. You have to have movement in your imaging to show instability. Now you can have some static uh, measurements like grab oaks, clavoaxial angle, that might be helpful in identifying someone who's unstable, but are not really great measurements for finding instability because they're static, they're not moving. So what you're asking kind of doesn't fit with what we know about how these things get measured. Um, so I need to know a lot more on which 
which things were found to be normal and then how that relates to DMA. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, the ability to actually uh, convince other specialists is oftentimes, even with all the right data, is something difficult to do, and I'll say insurance companies do. Um, they tend to have all the facts that they're interested in knowing, uh, and, you know, your narrative either fits their agenda or it doesn't, just seems to be kind of how it works and how it is. So, um, thank you for the question. Jay Vick asks, have you seen any kind of trend with Chiari with your CCI patients? Could you briefly speak on any relation you've observed between the two? Thank you both for your time. You're welcome, Jay. Yeah, so Chiari malformation, um, we definitely have a, a high percentage, I would say at least one in five, perhaps even one in four of the CCI patients that we treat would fit within the Chiari malformation spectrum. So just so the viewers understand what we're talking about, Chiari is when the uh, back part of the brain, the cerebellum usually, um, pushes, becomes too close to or pushes through the, the hole in the bottom of the skull. Uh, now, most of our patients would have Chiari zero. So Chiari zero just means that it's not really pushing down that much. Uh, and every once in a while, we'll see a Chiari where they're Chiari two, but, but certainly a high percentage of our patients have Chiari. Now, the problem is, do we know if Chiari is causing your symptoms or not? And the answer is, in order to find that out, we got to carve a hole in the back of your skull. So because of that, you know, it's, as long as it's a Chiari zero, uh, which again is 90% of the ones we see, uh, not even in my differential to care about it, because in order to see if it's causing your symptoms, you know, the procedure is so invasive that you might as well not pursue Fusion while you're at it. So, from my perspective, it's fairly all this important, but it may be important, obviously, eventually, if it moves on to surgery. Uh, in some cases, they say the cure is worse than uh, the disease. In this case, the test might be worse than the disease. Uh, so, careful on that one. Here we've got Manute follows up. He says, Thank you both. I have scheduled Dr. Centeno already for December. I will be canceling my posterior procedure. Thank you again. So there you go. You'll be seeing Minute in December. Let's, uh, hello, Pia. Is it a red flag for a clinic to usually prescribe morphine after PRP? Parentheses, too many white blood cells in the solution and too much inflammation. What do you think? Yeah, so kind of do different things there. I mean, morphine is powerful stuff. Um, there are oral morphine medications that you can take, but that's pretty, pretty aggressive, meaning that, you know, if you look at different painkillers, got maybe Tylenol down here and Tramdol over there. Then we get into things like Tylenol number three and then Percocet. And then we will get into things like the Lauded and then morphine. Um, so that's pretty powerful pain medication. Uh, one of the things we do know is that the more pain medication that you prescribe and the higher dose you prescribe, the more likely it is that the patient will become addicted, even if it's just given post procedure. But we doctors need to be very careful um, about trying to balance pain after a procedure with not giving someone too much stuff that one in five or one in 10 or one in 20 are going to just be randomly addicted to. Um, on the second issue you brought up with regard to the PRP, platelet-rich plasma uh, comes in two types, with and without white blood cell, red and amber. And the red stuff, I think is what you're talking about, is, is way too inflammatory. We don't use it very often other than a very specific scenario. The amber stuff is much less inflammatory. So that's our go-to. Sounds like a red flag. Uh, I also see in the question to usually prescribe morphine, uh, thus that being sort of the standard uh, and probably something to be aware of. Yeah, I think maybe what you're bringing up, and I think this is an important thing to, to recognize, is that at the end of the day, if you are um, using red PRP 
it normally causes a huge flare up in the patient. And that could be the reason why morphine is the standard go-to. Obviously it makes more sense not to use the red PRP and not to have to prescribe such incredibly strong pain meds. Uh, thus the logic would be there, exactly right. All right, let's go back to uh, Paul DeFusco. He says, if I'm not mistaken, Going above the atlas is the latest innovation in the PICL. I was wondering if you're exploring additional techniques to improve effectiveness and or safety, et cetera. Constantly, Paul. Um, so we've been going above, or I've been going above the atlas now for, I don't know, about two years, somewhere in there, maybe, maybe slightly longer, but it's now a go-to procedure this last year in certain situations, even in the first uh, procedure when we perceive that going below has an issue. As far as improvements, um, yeah, we're actually buying a second C-arm, a compact, so we can stack them. Um, so we'll have a, not right now, we have a C-arm that can go AP lateral, all sorts of different ways, but we want two views at once uh, to try to up the game and even improve the accuracy of these injections even further. So we'll have two C-arms in the room, probably starting next month or the month after that. I'm not quite sure when the second one will get here. Um, now, is that going to dramatically improve things? No, it's maybe going to add 5 10% improvement, but it's worth purchasing a second E-arm E-arm that 5 10%. Um, so, you know, it's going to be just warning patients. It's going to look a little intimidating. I mean, right now already, it's intimidating to have this big, Serum in there, but you're now going to have a second one, one going this way, one going that way. Um, so it's going to look pretty intimidating when you walk in, but it's to get another five or 10 percent accuracy. Uh, I'm going to brag on Dr. Centeno for just a moment because that's exactly, you know, Paul, you asked the question. That's exactly what you get at the Centeno Schultz Clinic is uh, a group of dedicated doctors uh, who are always on the cutting edge looking for what can they do better? How can they make it safer? How can they make it more effective? How can they accelerate your healing? That is part of the DNA of what you get at the Centeno Schultz Clinic as evidenced by literally the millions of dollars they invest without being reimbursed simply to understand or to, to learn and then understand What's going on? Why is it going on? And how do we do what we do better than not having that information? And that's really unique to anywhere else on the planet. Um, you know, we could go on probably, and we've done shows in the past with just the technology, a university grade research lab on site at a private practice is one of the more unique things you're going to find in the world. So go ahead, Doc. Yeah, I used to tell patients although it's not true anymore because the price of homes has gone up so much with all this inflation. But uh, it used to be that, you know, a CRM costs as much as a condo. Uh, now it's not really a condo. Most places it's like a not really nice Tesla, um, you know, 120 grand or so. So uh, not, not cheap to put a second one in there, but if it gets us another five to 10% accuracy, uh, it, it's worth it from a patient perspective. That's the investment in uh, wanting to be the best. All right, Elizabeth Rivard. Are most Regenix providers, uh, parentheses, who work with spinal issues, qualified to do posterior PRP and occipital hydrodissection? The big problem comes there um, when we're talking about what it is that's getting injected. So if we're talking about just doing the ligaments, supraspinous, interspinous ligaments, then that's fine. Um, but if we're talking about also adding in, for instance, the upper cervical facet joints, that's when we start to run into problems because we don't have anyone on our network who, and, and not just our network, we don't have anyone in the entire country. Uh, I don't care where they are, who they are, where they work, um, who has done those injections at those levels, C0, C1, C1, C2, uh, at least a couple hundred times. Um, because as I've always said, you know, doctors are no different than anyone else, right? If you started to learn the guitar, right, and you played the guitar 10 times, you're not gonna be very good at the guitar. You'll be, you know, you'll know a little bit. But if you do it a hundred times and you're really learning, 
you might be able to play for friends, but no one's going to mistake you for a rock star. Now, once you played your guitar a thousand times, you start to get in guitar expertise and you're going to sound really good. These injections are the same, right? If there's a doctor out there on our network, on our network, whatever, he's only injected those joints three dozen times, they're not very good at it. Um, so, you know, so the answer is no. If we're talking about injecting those joints, you got to come here. It's the only place on the planet Earth at the moment where someone has done that a thousand plus times. I've done it a thousand plus times. Your shoulder's done a thousand plus times. Probably in the several thousand range at this point. There's no one on the planet that's that's injected a C zero C one more than a hundred times. Um, let alone a thousand or two thousand or three thousand. The vertebral artery runs right there. It's like the artery that goes to the back of your brain. So if if that artery is injected into, and that doctor doesn't have digital subtraction angiography on their CR to make sure they're not injecting into it, then that's, let's just say that's a bad day for everybody. You got to be careful. You got to make sure you're working with those doctors who you can trust because they have the experience. Paul DeFusco follows up with, do you have an opinion on hyperbaric treatment, HBOT? Yeah, Paul, you know, I have patients that swear by it. Uh, we've never done a formal study, and I don't know of a formal study where HBOT has been added to plus or minus a, an injection like bone marrow concentrate or PRP. It would make sense that it would help, um, and I don't think it's going to hurt. So when patients ask about it, I say, listen, if you want to do HBOT, go for it. But we have no data there right now. I don't think it's going to hurt you, and it, and it could only help you. All right. Here we go. Jalal follows up. Jalal says, I most definitely have a response with my jaw and my C1. When it is out, my jaw twists to the right. And when it is adjusted, well, my jaw sits center. So Jalal, thanks for sharing and uh, sharing your experience with us. Paul DeFusco follows up yet again. You've endorsed chiropractic, chiropractic biophysics in the past, but the forum seems to mostly have patients doing NUCA or AO. I was wondering if that's because CB or CBP uh, is only recommended at a certain point in time for PICL patients or for any other reason. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, certainly NUCA and AO are, are go-tos, right? If you're out up here, they can get you back in. And for some patients, and I say some patients in my world, in their in their world, is many many patients, right? Um, uh, that can make a tremendous difference. Now we're talking about getting the curb back. The patient's got to be able to tolerate getting the curb back, so they've got to have enough stability to support that. And some patients can do that. Some patients can't tolerate that. So um, that's just an individualized. Thing. I often tell patients, if you want to do a quick test and see which, which box you're in roughly, this is not 100% accurate, you can roll up a towel and, and support your own curve while you're lying face up, experiment with the thickness of that towel, put it in the middle of your neck, and you're either going to feel like a million bucks or you're going to say, I shouldn't do that. In the million bucks camp, you should probably try CBP. If you're in the, hey, it's a dumb idea camp, then definitely don't try CBP until your doctor recommends it. There you go. Checking in with you on time. We got quite a few questions left, huh? I got, yeah, I got about five more minutes before I got to go to this other meeting. All right. I'll keep asking and you tell me when you're ready to wrap up. Uh, we got Elizabeth Rivard. She says, upper facet injections are only recommended by you when done at the CSC, correct? How common is it for you to see patients with abnormalities of the vertebral arteries when doing these types of delicate area injections? Yeah, the vertebral artery, like all arteries, has small uh, differences from person to person in where it goes. Um, that's why when we come up with a new technique, um, and I was the one that invented the newest technique for zero one, uh, the one that we use, we look at uh, all the different variations of that anatomy and plan a safe course. Um, and that's another problem because the technique we use, I, I invented, 
uh, is dramatically safer than the traditional technique that, that I and Dr. Schultz were taught to use. Um, and the problem with the traditional technique is it puts the vertebral artery in much more harm's way than our procedure because it's based on a not fully baked understanding of the joint's morphology. Um, so once we adjust for joint morphology, um, yeah, we haven't had any vertebral artery problems in thousands. And since we're the only one who have done thousands in one place, you know, that, that's as good as it gets right now. Because if you do it four or five dozen times, not a big end. There you go. Super important to go with those that have experience. Joe Henry, would patients with transverse ligament laxity experience more symptoms in flexion or extension due to the odontoid movement? It's, yeah, so if it's just that, it's generally more symptoms in flexion. Now, where it can be a little bit confusing is we certainly see some paradoxical, paradoxical situations where when the patient comes backwards or looks up, their spinal cord comes in contact with the dens, not because the den's moving, but because of the way other things are moving. So when it comes to just the transverse ligament in isolation, it would be flexion, but realize that incredibly in medicine, it's rarely just one thing. It might be predominantly this one, but a little bit of that one and that and this other one. So while we all love it to be one thing because it helps us wrap our brain around it, that's usually not the case in real patients. That's healthcare. That's people. That's how it is. We got Kristen uh, Isolin asking, are you seeing patients with intracranial hypertension symptoms have issues with PICL? Do they usually go into the negative response? to PICL. Yeah, that, that brings up a good uh, point. So we are still looking at all of that data. Now, intracranial, the problem here is that we're talking about some difficult concepts here. So let me, let me draw this out here because I think this is important to understand. Uh, so we've got intracranial, intracranial hypertension, We've got CCI. Uh, those are overlapping Venn diagrams. Uh, the symptoms overlap dramatically between those two. So do you have your symptoms coming from intracranial hypertension? Or do you have your symptoms coming from CCI? I would ask to you that no one has a clue um, because there isn't a way a diagnostic test that you can perform to state it's, it's uh, hypertension, uh, I can perform a diagnostic test to some degree, whether it's coming from CCI, but just realize at the end of the day, that's more confusing than it is helpful in us trying to look at this problem. There's such huge overlap between those two Venn diagrams. Critically important, again, why you need experts. Stacy uh, comes in and says uh, she scheduled another PICL with you in early July. Uh, still a bit confused about whether another DMX would be useful in my specific case. So we'll email you in June to get your advice. So keep a lookout for that. Thank you, Stacy. One more question and then I've, uh, I'm, I'm running late on this next meeting. So we'll just Got do it. more. Manute says, one more question. With a hangover of 9.7 millimeters, should I be expecting more symptoms like passing out or more neurological symptoms, more than the constant pain and radiculopathy and tachycardia? Uh, I wish there was a great relationship there, but I can't tell you there is. For instance, a lot of that would depend not only on the amount of motion, but how much room you have. So we've seen patients who can just, based on their congenital way they were put together have much less room up top there and they're going to be much more sensitive to that kind of overhang or even less than someone who was built like the rest of us who have a lot of room up top through that area so it's a it's a complex issue as to who gets the most symptoms not just based on the numbers all righty uh, Stacy, I see your question. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Please make sure either to ask us on Friday or next Monday or in your email, as I know you know how to email Dr. Centeno. Unfortunately, Dr. Centeno has got to move on to other meetings. 
Um, but thank you for taking the time to join us here today. As you know, we're here on Mondays at the Centennial Schultz page. We're on Fridays at the Regenix Facebook page. We're here serving you. I can see our audience numbers going up, and for that, we say thank you. That means you're sharing this program with others on social, and you are doing all the right things. We're going to cut it short here on behalf of Dr. Chris Centeno. I'm Dr. Jason Deitch. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for sharing. Until Friday, stay well, be kind, and thank you for watching.